Hey guys, and welcome to What to Six and Allies. My name is Jessica Likewise, and I am the CEO of Hope Education Services. This is a brand new series that I am co-hosting with the amazing Jeff Snyder. Jeff Snyder is an autism self-advocate, a social media influencer, and just one of the kindest and wisest people that I've ever met. Jeff knows I lovingly refer to him as the wise owl from like Winnie the Pooh, where people just go to Jeff to hear his perspective and his opinions. Um, this is really brought to you by Jeff. I'm just here to um, help facilitate it because I have the technology and the platform. But Jeff, this was Jeff's idea and the idea of getting together the autistic community and allies of the autistic community, whether that's concerned family members, concerned friends, teachers, advocates, um, education advocates, lawyers, people in the community who really just are interacting every day with everyone who can just be good people and make the world a better place for everyone to live. So I'm going to share tonight a little bit. We made a little presentation and then I'm going to close that down because I do want to make sure um, that we are ever able to see everybody since everyone's talking. But I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to do. So here we go. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about police officer interactions with the autistic community. Now I do have some ground rules. Those ground rules are important. Number one, we're not going to turn this into a political thing and we're not going to turn this into any sort of aimed any group of people being the, the group. The purpose of this is to move things forward, not to really look at any one group of people and make them wrong about anything. So it's very important that we're doing, if there's issues, you can obviously discuss them. The point of this is to discuss things that are going on for the point of moving things forward. But we're going to refrain from using specific names of individuals. Um, we're going to refrain from really kind of pointing fingers at any one group of people. So in the event that that happens, we're going to have to, um, we'll have to kind of stop the discussion and, and rework it because we really want to make this a moving forward, not a political event. So we have four, converse, four questions we're going to really talk about tonight. It's going to be an open dialogue. So everyone who wants to talk can, um, you can just unmute yourself and you can give your perspective and that's it. So we have four conversations we're going to go through. And one is really, what are some ways we can improve relationships between the police and autistic community? The second one is how might parents best prepare their children to engage with law enforcement? What are some strategies that police can use to effectively communicate with a person with autism? And do we rely more on police officers or mental health professionals for situations involving developmental disabilities, which is, I think is an important topic to talk about, is what role do professionals um, need to play in really making sure that in the event that there is a situation arises and someone may not understand what's happening, there's someone there to support them. So that's really kind of what we're going to go through. And I will go back to this PowerPoint, but I want you to see everyone talking. So I'm going to stop this show now. Um, we're going to start off with, again, what are some ways in which we can improve relationships between the autistic community and the adult community. I'm actually going to mute everybody if you're not talking because there is a lot of background noise. If you want to say something, just unmute yourself just because I'm getting a lot of feedback. So has anyone here had any negative experiences with police officers or know of anybody firsthand who has had negative experiences with police officers because they were autistic, not because maybe you disagreed about a parking ticket or um, something like that. But is there anything anyone has to share that maybe you have firsthand experience or anything you've witnessed in terms of there being a gap between police understanding the behavior of someone who's autistic and that leading to an unfortunate circumstance? So if anyone has anything to share on that topic, I'm just going to ask you to unmute now and to share that. I do. I have uh, some situations I can share. And I've been training police for about 20 years. Uh, my name is Thomas Island. I live in Los Angeles, California. And I was diagnosed with autism when I was 13. And I was learning to drive. And my mother gave me a card describing what autism is to keep in my wallet with my ID. And when I got pulled over, I thought to myself, the officer wants to see my ID. And I started to reach for it. The officer said, sir, hands on the steering wheel where I could see them, please. Had he been a little bit trigger happy that day, I may not be talking to you right now. 
And I told my mother about this situation and she's like, oh great, I'm training my kid to get shot. So there were some missing pieces of the equation that day. One, I thought that that officer knew that I was going for my card. And at the same time, the officer didn't know I was going for that card. So there's the breakdown or missing pieces of this puzzle, so to speak, from both sides of both parties. So the officer not knowing that I was going for that card and me not knowing I should keep my hands where I could, where they can be seen before or until the officer says, let me see your ID and then I can reach for it safely. So that experience along with a lot of experiences my mother's clients have had over the years she was an advocate for about 300 families in my hometown here for over the course of 10 years many of them having difficulties with the legal system like being one there was one young man who was pulled from his classroom and questioned by police without his mother's or the school principal's knowledge and he passed the questions to be interrogated like do you know the difference between right and wrong is this a black shirt and he passed and he, he was questioned and recorded and went on to confess to a crime he didn't commit so clearly both parties are missing valuable pieces of information and both parties need to understand the expectations when it comes to interactions so what my mother and i do to this day and we have gone virtual in light of COVID 19 is we introduce the two parties, people with autism and police in communities around the country and establish that relationship and make it personal too, to bridge that gap so that they're, they're not strangers anymore. And this is really what's missing in a lot of communities, that face-to-face, -face, that eyes on introduction and training so that both parties will understand one another better and have better outcomes. Yeah, that's a really important perspective. And, you know, it's interesting because depending upon, like you said, where you live, you may not be here today if you were reaching down into your pockets. You know, the reality of it is, is that police officers get shot at all the time. And so it really is a real fear that if someone may be reaching for something, what they're going to pull out, like they might be pulling out a weapon. And that certainly is a real fear. And that's something that I think that everyone needs to also understand, right? But with that said, if someone is reaching for, you know, something, some sort of card. So, and it's hard, it's hard for a police officer to judge a situation immediately. So I think from that, what I'm learning from that is that it's probably really important that when someone with autism learns to drive and really probably just anyone, because I think this could happen to anyone, not even someone who's autistic, that maybe we need to role play in schools more like in a driver's education, how to handle a situation when you're pulled over. So I have no experience teaching, um, teaching driver's education, and I don't work typically with teenagers where they would be learning to drive um, like at that age. But it's, very, it's, it's an interesting perspective. I don't remember when I was in driver's ed having been taught what to do if someone pulled you over. And I kind of just knew, I mean, my father is a police officer, was a police officer, so I kind of had that knowledge of like what to do. But that may not be intuitive for everybody. So that's a really great point that that would be something that we could do. Thomas, I'm curious because, you know, the reality of it is, is that a lot of times people want to just make people wrong about it. And we're not making anyone wrong about anything in this perspective. You know, certainly I can see how in that perspective you could have gotten shot. And I can also see from the perspective of a police officer, how they could have been scared in the event that they didn't realize what was happening. Um, it's easy to say like, okay, well, we'll just train people on how to respond. And yes, I think probably in this situation, given that circumstance, the more important thing to do would be to train people from um, t people that are driving. So anyone, whether or not they're autistic or not, what to do in the event they're pulled over right in like a driver's education. That might even be something important to do just for states, asking states to make a requirement when someone gets their license that maybe you know there's part of a driver education course maybe putting like a safety video on what to do if you're pulled over maybe that needs to be incorporated into requirements for all states for getting a license but what pers what information thomas like do you share with police officers because you know in that cir in that circumstance i actually would lean to more towards that being an education for people that are driving as opposed to a police education issue 
But if, if you have any ideas of what you're doing with your parents and how you're helping communicate that with police officers, I'd love for you to share that because it's something all of us could help with. Um, and it's something that's important. Certainly. So uh, my mother and I have discovered over the years, both with my own experiences and her clients, is that train the police is not enough anymore. People with and without autism need to know the expectations and the protocols and the procedures with police. And some of the work that uh, my mother and I have done have gone into other states. And you were talking about driver's ed. There is one in particular that my mother and I found out about in Albany, New York. The students are trained in driver's ed and the police are part of the equation too. Sorry about my dog there. And so part of the procedure is after they get trained or educated, they then go into their cars and the police get into their squad cars and then they practice getting pulled over, lights, sirens on, everything. And then they find out what to say and what not to say. And one little promise I had to make with my mother is I love Jim Carrey movies and Liar Liar, Dumb and Dumber, Ace Ventura. He, Jim Carrey says some things in those movies that don't really go down too well with police. So I had to make the promise that I'm not gonna say anything to an officer that Jim Carrey says in his movies. And I've kept that promise. But think about what people with autism might say, what kind of scripts they have in their heads that are playing and will play out to a T and may not be acceptable to an officer or might catch an officer off guard or may even warrant an arrest in some cases. So both parties, police and people with autism need education on this topic. And there are some cities, jurisdictions that are incorporating such training into their driver's ed classes already. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think that what I want to come from this is like practical things that all of us can do in order to move things forward. I think for all of us to contact the police department and say like, hey, listen, you know, would you be willing to do this? Like, would you be willing to go into the school and show data? And then there are examples of people having been injured or arrested or shot because um, of similar situations where they didn't know how to respond you know, incorporating that training into driver's ed, that's a fantastic idea. It's something that I think we could all practically help participate in contacting our driver's education, contacting the superintendent. Maybe contacting the superintendent is a little easier than contacting the police department, but contacting the superintendent of a school district and saying, hey, listen, you know, this is working really well, this program that's being piloted in Albany, and would you um, consider doing this? Now, Jesse, I'm curious, Jesse is here. Jesse is from Albany. And Jesse, I don't know, um, you probably went through drivers at a, a little bit, a few years ago, more than, more than two, I'll just say. Um, do you remember doing that when you were in driver's ed? And do you know anything about the program that Albany is doing now? Uh, you're, you're muted, Jesse. I muted everybody when they're not talking just because we're getting feedback with so many people on. Well, um, I've not heard of that program, but it sounds quite interesting. I'm quite happy that they're uh, doing it in my home community right now. And I had written to you privately that a lot of individuals with autism, they do things with the best of intentions but they do not always realize that's overstepping boundaries. And I think in my opinion, at least from my experience, an individual with autism is much more likely to be accused of something like stalking or be uh, seen as a potential pedophile as opposed to uh, accidentally uh, pulling a weapon or uh, appearing to be a, a threat physically to an officer. And the misunderstandings that I've dealt with have uh, reminded have reminded me that no one is immune and some and it's important to know how to diffuse these misunderstandings and hopefully the officer can uh, encourage the person to tell their side of the story and give them the benefit of the doubt yeah that's a really great point of, point of view as well so Lizzie I know it seems like Lizzie you have something to add I'd love for you to unmute and add it yeah, I agree with what Tom says about, you know, it's, you know, we're at the point where the education just, you know, teaching the officers isn't enough. The, the, the education needs to come on both hands. And, you know, one thing, you know, as a case manager, I, I, I my interaction is with, with families whose children 
who have autism at the level where there's no subtlety, it's, it's quite obvious. And one thing I do, um, one thing I recommend is visit the police station in your precinct at different hours to get acquainted with different officers. Or if you see a police officer in the community, you know, just approach them and introduce, introduce yourself. When I was in direct care, my last job, there was this one individual who, well, let, let's just say I saw some police officers that I knew from a, a previous job. I used to be a Starbucks barista, so that's a good way to meet cops if they come in. So I was with this client and I introduced him to the officers that I know, so that way to put my client at, the, at ease, but also to send a message to the officers that, hey, people such as this person exist in your community and in your patrol zone. And they're, you know, th this person may present okay now, but if they're in a crisis or some type of first responder situation, they may not be, you know, presenting li like this. Another uh, thing that I recommend is, I, I know that there's some dramatization with cop shows, like the old show Cop or things like that. But I grew up sort of watching that, and my neighbor down the street happened to be a federal law enforcement officer. So sometimes, you know, to get attention of kids playing in the street, he would flash his, flash his lights in his unmarked vehicle, or he had those, he had a car where he could just put the flashers on. And sometimes he told me, you know, how to be careful, you know, with, with any law enforcement, you know, official. So one time I got pulled over, I knew to keep my hands visible and say, hey, I'm reaching for, you know, this, or, or in some cases where I knew I was going to get pulled over, as I was coming to a stop, I got into my wallet as I was holding it and got out my driver's license, it, you know, insurance and everything, so it would already be in hand when the police officer got there. And that's what happened when I was, one time it happened when I was driving for Uber. So basically, I think, expo you, know, you know, friendly exposure in a neutral situation to officers, um, you know, is good. Or if we see any first responder, like at the store, approach them, well, these days not too closely, of course, but say, hi, you know, just wondering, you know, what areas do you cover? I will like, thank you. I mean, and you can also, you know, enter the, begin the conversation a different way, but then also squeeze, in, oh, my child is autistic or has this type of, you know, you know, disability, and is there some way we can make ourselves known to you? So when, if, if in the event that you do get dispatched to our house, things like that, that that's what I sort of the advice that I give to the parents on my caseload. Um, so that that's also um, one thing, and also you said you know coming to the schools, which is definitely a good idea. When I was in Montessori school, EMTs and police officers came to our schools and visit. And I remember the old PBS show, Kids Song, there was an episode on interacting with the police. I think we need to, you know, you know, get get those um, you know, shows on and parents are telling me, I'm trying to get my kid not to watch Sesame Street. And I'm like, Sesame Street, they actually learn something. So so basically that's one thing, those are some of the things that I that, that came to mind. Yeah, I always encourage parents and I completely agree. I think that it's a parent's <laughs> responsibility when you have a child that has autism or any sort of developmental challenges to make sure that police officers know that. Now it's, it's more practical in a smaller town than in a major city. You know, I spent eight years living in the Bronx and it's, the police force is huge. So it's not necessarily practical in the city. And I think that's partially why in the city sometimes things happen more that don't happen in small towns. But you know, if you live in an area where, you know, even for now I live in a major city area and I mean, I can see the, Empire State Building from my office, I, it, but it's still not a huge police force. You know, I know the police officers there and I have to say, so I had a situation once where I had um, someone, there was a man and he was leaning on my fence and my dog started barking at him. And then he, the man started shouting at me and threatening me. So I called the police. Um, the police came to my home and they said, look, we know this person and this person uh, is developmentally challenged. They didn't say he was aut autistic and I didn't have any interactions with this person, but they told me, you know, we know this person and he's harmless. He shouldn't have said what he said, but we don't feel like you're in danger. And if you feel like you're in danger, we will arrest him and we will press charges. 
but just so you are aware, this man has a developmental disability and we you know, would uh, prefer to just drive him home. And that's what the police officer said to me. And I thought that was fantastic. And I said, you know what? Okay, like if, and I said, you know, you don't think he's any threat? And they said, no, he's harmless. He just shouldn't have, he shouldn't have said what he did, but we don't think he's a threat to you. And I said, okay, well, based upon that, I won't press charges. But the man would have probably been a very different situation. And I didn't know because I didn't interact with him, right? There was just a man yelling through my window, so I called the police. I didn't go out and interact with him, or as I might have realized that for myself. But I thought that was an example of police doing a really good job and just knowing when um, there wasn't a need, there wasn't a real threat there. So it's important for, I think, parents, and this was a, this was a grown man, but it's important for parents, I think, to let people know, especially teenagers, especially if it's going to be a teenager, you know, one of the biggest things I think that happens for autistic young adults is when kids are in the park and they're in the teenager years and they're stimming. And then the police officers think that they're on drugs and then the police officers will tell them something and the police don't respond. There's been many examples. I don't know anything firsthand, but examples I see in the news all the time, um, unfortunately, way more often than any of us would want to happen where a teenager with autism is arrested because they were engaging in a stimming behavior then didn't respond to police. A lot of these events I'm seeing in the news, these are actually taking place in small towns. So yes, I think having the ID, Thomas, like you had, I do encourage parents to do that. Um, realistically though, in like a practical situation, if a police officer sees someone, whether they're flapping their hands or like jumping up and down and moving their hands, and making loud noises and the police don't know what's going on, they're typically not going to look for that ID. And a person that is developmentally challenged to the point that they may be doing that and not able to respond to a police officer to stop, they probably would not necessarily in that moment, being they're probably gonna wind up in some sort of sensory overload, they're probably not going to have the wherewithal to respond to taking out an ID, which is you know an added confusion for parents. Because even if you train, you teach someone in a, like you try and we call it training, but if, if you show someone what to do in the situation when it's outside of the actual real difficult situation, once you're in that situation, it's a lot harder for someone to respond. I mean, anyone who gets pulled over, I've gotten pulled over and I am nervous, right? It's just a natural reaction, whether you're autistic or not. So it, it may be more difficult to respond appropriately. So I think a lot of those issues can be solved by parents just take, you know, calling the police and letting them know. There are like registries also where if someone is diagnosed with autism, they're required, parents are required to register their child or the doctors do it automatically, register their child. I don't know what anyone's perspective of this is, but I think it would be a good idea for the Department of Health to share the registry with police officers. So police officers are aware of if they're responding someplace that they are um, there's someone there that could, is autistic that they may be in a different perspective. Now, some people might say that's a violation of privacy, but the information is being collected and stored. And if it's used to keep people safe and protect people, um, I think that would be a really good use of that information. So if anyone has a perspective of that, I'd love for you to unmute and share your perspective. Actually, so, Jessica, um, oh, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep mine brief and then I'll go to you. Uh, so you were talking about uh, a situation where like a young man, someone was stimming. That actually did happen about two years ago in Buckeye, Arizona. A young man was stimming by sniffing a piece of string and the park he was in was notorious for drug use. And an officer sees this and thinks that the guy is using drugs and asks him if he has ID and the kid says no, starts walking away and the officer grabbed him, proceeded to take him down the ground. It was caught on body cam and it went viral and Buckeye just settled a $5 million lawsuit in light of that incident. So that's certainly one incident where both the officer and the young man were missing some pieces of information. As for the registry that you were talking about, uh, my mother started a registry in Santa Clarita where I live that was recognized by the Department of Homeland Security. And while you're not required to provide this information, keep in mind that if your person with autism goes missing, it could save up to one to three hours of information gathering to have that information available so that a, a missing person's flyer can be generated like that and be made available to squad cars. So anytime you can go to your local 
sheriff station or police department and have that information available on a flyer, like the person's name, what kind of medications they're on, what calms them down, description, a recent photo, and update this information constantly, then a person who goes missing or is in trouble or in danger can be found quickly. So yeah, that's it happens one. more often than I think people care to, to know or to, it happens a lot. As a matter of fact, yesterday, and I don't know whether the person has been found or not yet, I looked for it online and I didn't see any information on it, but in the town next to mine, about two miles from my home, there is a, there was, as of, at least as of yesterday, a teenage autistic boy, that was an 11-year-old boy that had gone missing. And that happens frequently. I mean, that's happened locally in my area several times and not every time the outcome was good. And, you know, sometimes one or two hours is the difference between finding someone, there's been cases where children have drowned or been hit by a car in one hour to save that fire could have saved that person's life. So I think that's a fantastic idea. Michelle, what did you Michelle, want to yeah. add on that? <laughs> Yeah, so actually speaking of the, the registry in my county here in New Jersey, in Monmouth County, we actually have um, our own registry and stuff. And it's, it is voluntary and stuff. And like, what they would do is that, and I'm actually looking at it right now on my phone and stuff. They were like saying about how like, all registrants, like they would be issued like window decals that would be placed like on the front, like of their cars and stuff. So that way they would, um, they would understand that that's also a person that has a developmental disability or even autism and stuff. So that's another way to detect as well that like there's an individual that's driving that has autism and or like a developmental disability. But that's just like one of the things that in my county that they're doing in terms with the police department. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a great, I think that's a great idea. You know, I was also gonna say that earlier that it might be advisable for someone who may not be able to respond to instructions to even have a decal on the car yeah. or a license plate. Just like someone who would have like a physical handicap can have that identified on their car. It may be just as important or even more important for someone with a developmental challenge to have that on their car as well. So that's a really great perspective. Does anyone else have anything they want to add or share to the conversation? Jeff, yeah. Jeff Bunsen. You guys can just unmute. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but I just have everyone muted for, for the background noise. Well, I, I, think, I think the important thing is um, that I think a lot of, a lot of people who, um, a lot of people wander and that, that could be something that I think because, you know, parents will often call the police to, because if, if their child goes missing, then they would, uh, they would call the police and say, um, my son's missing, can you find him? And of course the child may not, the child or teenager may not understand. And when the cop approaches them, they get nervous and they, they, do this, they do what's called flight or fight. And they may not understand the, cop person, the police officer's commands and say, because the cop might be saying, um, don't worry, I'm here to help you. And the kid runs off and, and the cop has to give chase. And, at the, and you have to understand also from the cop's perspective that you know, the person may, may, may be carrying something like a weapon or something like that and may, not, and may not understand. So when it comes to, I think, wandering, then that would be something that I think cops would have to, you know, be trained, you know, they have to train, you know, how to respond just to like a child who's gone missing. And some of them may not even be, some, and there may be a child that may not be nonverbal. So those are the kind of things that I think we as a community need to open the eyes, open to, to police officers and other types of law enforcement that not everyone's going to respond to commands. And I think, you know, the question is, how should people, police respond to a nonverbal child with autism that has wandered off? That should be one of the big questions. Yeah, and I see Jesse putting in the chat that 
like should someone who's autistic train police officers? And I think that's a great idea. And then Lizzie's in the chat saying she agrees as well. Um, Jesse, is there something you want to add to that? I am not used to um, unmuting myself. Uh, and I was saying that um, when uh, I got a ticket in Red Hook for going a little bit too fast because I forgot there was a speed limit, um, I tried pleading it down to giving community service and uh, training the police department instead of uh, paying the fine, which I think would be more valuable than the monetary fine. And I believe it's important because as you Many times, but only we have that unique perspective that we can bring to the table. And I believe that a lot of us, uh, especially those like me who grew up in the 1990s, are used to being bullied, pushed around, intimidated, and therefore a police officer has to be assertive. And a lot of those feelings and excess baggage may come flooding back. So the officer needs to be trained in diffusing the situation and explaining, I'm not here to give you a hard time. This is my job. I just want to make sure everything is all right. And what can I do to help you and make this a little bit easier and make it about the person's comfort zone. And maybe the uh, person would say, Hey, I feel more comfortable, uh, you know, flapping my hands or squeezing a ball. And that would uh, diffuse the, Things that it'll, it'll look on drugs. Yeah, that's a great perspective, Jesse. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think this is really helpful. I think, um, do you guys like having this forum where we can come together and discuss issues that are really pertaining to the, uh, the autism artistic community, depending upon how you like to phrase it? Is this helpful for people? Do you like this idea? I like it. I like it. Very good. So um, is it, unless anyone has anything they want to add, I'm going to try to keep these to be about 40 minutes. So that way the replays are reasonable for people to watch, I think. Um, so Lizzie, you want to add something? Yeah, one thing that me and Michelle sort of been um, chatting about is to include officers in the training, especially like an officer who has a child of, you know, of a child with a disability or who is autistic. This one month, I mean, I attended uh, a session about this in 2018 at, at the Art National Convention. The director of the Art of Colorado said they always try to get um, a police officer, whether it be detective, uniformed officer, or whatever, of a child with special needs. That way, the, the cop can say, this is my child. You may be interacting with him or his friends. I do not want to hear one of my cops mistreating my son or his friends. So you want to be able to have a cop who can speak at that level, you know, to the cops. And I, you know, because you also want a cop who can speak both autism and cop. So that's why it's also good to bring, you know, good to bring a law enforcement official to co-train with you as, as well. Because sometimes there are cops out there who get the training, but they're not gonna be receptive to it unless one of their professional peers gives them a little nudge and saying, hey, this is the reality because we could, you know, say to a cop, hey, you know, this, this would happen, but we also want a cop who may be a parent of a child with autism and say, hey, yes, I agree. You know, this is, you know, you know, what we can do so we can provide two perspectives within the same training. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I think that's a great, if that's available, that's um, certainly, you know, the more different perspectives we have and parent perspective is important. Michelle, was there something you wanted to add as well? No, Michelle, uh, good. Well, I'll say that uh, in my experience and with my mother's experience, if your community has a, a police or fire a chief, captain, sheriff, or other head honcho with someone with autism or another disability in their family, that's the person you should be approaching or motivating to get this training or this education out there because when it's made personal it matters more and like lizzie mentioned that they don't want to hear about their family being mistreated or i expect you cops to treat my children or my relative 
well. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Jeff, there's something you wanted to add? Me? Yeah. Hi. I'm Jeff, uh, New Jersey. Uh, just uh, thinking about a couple of statements, uh, the, it's called the CAD uh, database that some towns have, the CAD database. And also, <clears throat> you know who the cop is, he doesn't know who you are. And uh, you gotta remember that, you know, he, know, he, he knows that the officer approaching the car, he knows that he doesn't know you but you know who he is because he has his uniform on. Um, and also, you just say, as we said earlier in the, in the dialogue, you can say something like, I'm going to reach into my left pocket, very slowly take out my wallet, okay. And then, you know, take it out, say, I'm gonna hand it to you, okay. It, it just, and also it creates a spirit of uh, um, cooperation and uh, turn the interior light on if it's nighttime. And uh, uh, <sighs> yeah, that's a great, Jeffrey. That's a great um, advice. Thank you. And that is important to remember that you know that police officer, police officer, but they don't know who you are. And I think that's really the hard part is that a police officer, it's hard for someone to determine right away. And just like you're in a place of fight or flight, so is the police officers. It's hard to determine right away that that person is, um, is, is, is autistic or developmentally challenged or any other disability that they're gonna act differently. So that's really important to know. So I'm gonna wrap up um, the tonight. Was there, Jesse, was there something you wanted to add before we did real quick? You're talking to me? Yeah, I thought someone had said something. But um, if not, like, I think this has been really, really helpful. And I think that we're going to continue to do this. Uh, we'd like to do these once a month, these Autistic and Allies. And I'd love for you to guys invite your friends, invite people in the community, especially like one thing we could think about next time is inviting if we're doing this um, with police officers or firefighters or whatever we're going to be doing. We're going to, we should invite people in the community to be part of that so they can they can understand it as well. I'm gonna email this to everybody who joined and was on here tonight. If you guys can post it on social media, particularly posting it in Facebook groups, that's actually the best way to get information across. When, we do, when we're do, when we posting things in Facebook groups, Facebook really likes the algorithm right now. They're trying to promote groups because of the social interaction of groups. So if you guys can, I'm gonna you know, put this on YouTube by tomorrow, I'll email this out to you guys tomorrow. If you can just post it in a few places, that way more people are aware of this and we'll do this every month. So if you joined on this, you will get an invitation for next month's topic, which Jeff and I have not chosen yet, but we will come up with a calendar for the rest of the year with topics and dates for the rest of the roundtables um, by next month. We wanted to make sure this went over well. So thank you guys all so much for being here, making this possible. This is our first one. Um, and you will always be able to tell your friends and family members, they can always go to the website, autisticsandallies.com to register. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Jessica and Jeff. Thank you, Jessica.